Well, I was a city boy. You can't get much more city than I was. I was born on Peachtree Street, Crawford Long Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, we lived in Atlanta while I was a kid. Fortunately, I had an uncle who had a farm over in West Georgia, Polk County. So in the summertime, we would spend time out there. We would fish in the summertime. We'd go squirrel hunting in the fall. So that's where I really got my connection to the outdoors. For me, I like being outdoors, fishing, and it, and it's far. It just makes me forget about everything else that's going on. I can just think about what I'm doing, or or not think about anything, and um, it's just it's a it's exhilarating, but it's also so relaxing too. It puts everything in perspective for me. That when you're out here in nature. All of a sudden, a lot of the stuff that goes on on the asphalt and concrete that you put up with at other times just doesn't really matter. You, you get a new frame of reference from being out here and the natural world around you and your interaction with it. You know, I, I think Georgians, well, we do actually talk slower than people from other parts of the country. And, you know, I think part of that is the rural, the rural nature of the state, which went on for a couple of hundred years, is the fact that when you live out in the country, you're not in much of a hurry to do anything. And everything slows down, including the way you talk. And, and I think that uh, when you get a good Southern boy telling a story, he realizes that timing is everything. And when you're giving somebody a good yarn, and with that timing, you tend to slow down. You, you gotta get those one-liners in the right place. And I think it's just, you know, we are a storytelling telling people. And I think that's part of it. When I leave the city, you know, everything begins to slow down as I get here. Once I'm out here, you know, it doesn't matter whether I throw 60 casts in the next hour or I throw 30 casts. You know, it, it's a different pace. and it just takes me to the most beautiful places and, and it just makes me really look at my surroundings everywhere I go and makes me want to and really appreciate the diversity that we have, you know, to the marshes, to the river, to the mountain. Without the fishing, I don't think I ever would have noticed that before. We bought the farm in 78. Been farming that original land, was, which was 895 acres, I believe. It's grown over the years to about 2,000 here. 
and about a, a little over a thousand at the other farm. We grow the same crops we've always grown. We've always did good rotation as far as not planting one crop like cotton over and over and over. It enhances the soil and, and makes everything better, grow better. We produce mainly cotton, followed by peanuts, corn, wheat, rye. We have grown soybeans, and we do grow some milo as a second crop behind corn. Of course, the airplane is very instrumental in the farming business, too. And David is the pilot, David Everidge. He's an aerial farmer and a dirt farmer. Not every farmer has the benefit of a, a pilot that works on the farm, too. There are good crop years. There are disastrous crop years. We went through one, and that's the reason Ronnie and his brother Marcus went separate ways, because it was a disaster. We lost the whole crop, over a million dollars worth of crop. Technology's booming, changing everything from cotton pickers to tractors to airplanes. Everything's more efficient, but it's more costly too. So there again, you have to have more acres to justify the cost. You either grow or you have to go. Going into the technology, uh, labor is not as big a problem as it used to be, and that used to be a high expense item. But now it's gradually been replaced with the cost of technology. We're actually paying more, probably more, for the technology to simplify our operation. Some of it, some of it we've got to, we've, we've had to accept to make us more efficient. As time changed, uh, our farm, like so many others, lost the economy of scale. It just, it just would not pay or wouldn't support. So I had to come up a, as a young fellow, I had to come up and make a decision to, to either buy other farms and try to increase what we were doing, or I could leave the farm, get an education, and be associated with it in some form or fashion. Well, it was cheaper for me to get an education in agriculture and be associated uh, w with farming. Cottonseed, it used to be around $30 a bag, and cottonseed was relatively cheap, and if you had to replant, no big thing, you know, $30. But now we're paying $400 a bag, plus $400 on a tech fee. So, so you have to use technology to stay in the business because you can't, you can't afford to lose or be inefficient when you're dealing with a high-priced in input as the seed and the technology. It, it, it speeds up our work so that we can cover more acres in a day. It reduces our waste as, as a double application or double spray or, or whatever. So it's good, also good for the environment in that we don't use as much chemicals, fertilizer, or whatever the inputs we're using, you know, being precise with the, with the GPSs. My main job is in the office. I just keep up with all everything that goes on and pay all the bills. And, and Donnie's main job is not only in the office, but taking care of all the grounds and driving tractors too, you know, as needed. But Scott and David and Marcus, as far as planting, harrowing, plowing, anything to do with, with the farm, the dirt. That's, that's their job. And we're at a generation gap, and if you pull it up, I think the average age, age of the farmer now is somewhere in the high 50s, low 60s. There is no people coming behind us. If I were a non-farmer and wanted my sustainable food supply, I would be having somebody look at what's going to happen when all the older people die off. I love it here. I don't care about going anywhere else. <laughs> Thank you.
the nature of my relationship with the outdoors has changed probably quite a bit. As a kid, being introduced to the outdoors, you know, I think like most kids, camping and hiking and those sorts of things, it felt a bit like a chore. Mom and dad want to take me here, they want to take me there. I don't really want to be outside, I'd rather be with my friends or I'd rather be doing any number of things than being outside where it's hot and there are bugs. But I slowly grew to love it because there's that foundation of experience that, you know, it's really carried over into my adult life and it made me realize that it's an absolute essential part of my life. The pace of my work in life require moving, thinking constantly at the call of clients or partners, so it's fast paced. I work for a news outlet and it's very fast paced, it's news of the day. Things are expected to be accomplished quickly on deadline as it's very hectic, the nine to six schedule, sometimes eight to seven or eight to eight or eight to two in the morning is a very demanding schedule. Talking to someone about my relationship with nature really requires me <laughs> to actually think about what that relationship is. And it's not something that I have a great answer for. It's just such an incredible way to get space and to just move everything that's in your brain, move it to the sides or move it completely out. And you can spend a couple of days in nature away from those things and come back with some different perspectives. And I think maybe that's one of the big things for me too, is I often have great conversations with my friends and family when I'm out in nature. You can really listen to somebody, I think, because they're not thinking about what they've got to do tomorrow at work. You don't have to go to work tomorrow. And all you've got to do is enjoy this campfire or enjoy the river, and you can have a great conversation with somebody.
being out in nature allows you to be in the moment with yourself and with your friends and family. I wouldn't really be able to do what I do where I grew up in suburban Long Island. We didn't really have an area like this where it was like a pristine, protected area where I could go and I could research animals in their natural habitat. Those types of areas are really far and few between where I grew up. For me to do what I do, I'd have to go to more of a rural, remote place. And the fact that I can do that down here allows me to study animals in their natural habitat where it's not forced and it's not in a zoo, it's not some kind of a situation like that. And you can really get their natural history and their behavior because, you know, they're in their natural environment. So I used to live about five miles from the Jones Center. I was driving home one day and saw this big hay bale had fallen off a truck. And I thought to myself, well, that would be really good mulch. And so I rushed home and grabbed and a rusty old pitchfork and, and found myself on the side of a road with a pitchfork getting hay into the back of the truck. I just kind of had a moment where I thought 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I would never ever have pictured myself in southwest Georgia on the side of a road getting hay for a garden. Knowing how I grew up in, in New York, I just never would have thought I would have gotten to this point. So I started off my wildlife biology career working with bats and that was because I was fascinated with a creature that people don't know a lot about and people have misconceptions about and that kind of rolled over into me working with snakes in a very similar way. There's a lot of misconceptions about snakes, people are scared of snakes. Well, one of the biggest conservation issues for wildlife in general is habitat loss. And it's, it's not only important to have the habitat itself, to have a contiguous habitat is important too. So if you have areas that are fragmented by roads and just parcels here and there, that's going to be detrimental to wildlife too. So it's, it's really, really important to have huge contiguous spaces. Snakes have a very important function in the, the longleaf pine ecosystem in particular. They are important predators of, of rodents, rats, and mice. They do even have a very important function economically with farmers around here because pests like mice and rats that try to decimate crops, they'll come in and snakes are a really good way, a cheap way, to get rid of those, those pests. They do fill an important niche in this ecosystem and without them you wouldn't have the balance that that is required for a, a healthy ecosystem. So the longleaf pine ecosystem is one of the most endangered ecosystems in the world. And only 3 to 5 percent of what historically was here is still around. It used to range from Florida all the way up to North Carolina, and now there's only really small pockets of longleaf pine ecosystem left. There's a lot of animals that really depend on the ecosystem, the longleaf pine ecosystem, that are endemic to this area that if the longleaf pine ecosystem goes away, so does these animals.
wildlife and habitat loss is happening at a pretty alarming rate, especially in Georgia. A lot of the suburban areas are moving further and further out, displacing wildlife. I think that's, that's one of our biggest threats and biggest issues. Down here, where you have a lot of, of natural land still available, because it's, it's difficult to make a living farming, people who own lots of natural areas like pine plantations and things like that, it might be more economical to sell that property off, you know, to development. And so it's getting, you know, harder and harder essentially to, to keep that habitat wild.